Hello and welcome everyone. I am Dr. Gustavo Tolosa and no, I'm not a medical doctor. I am a doctor in music and um, I have a doctorate in musical arts from the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. And I am an active concert pianist and a music professor. But besides music being one of my passions, healthy nutrition, based on an unprocessed whole food plant-based way of eating is my other passion so perhaps you have seen my webinars with plant-based doctors and chefs and perhaps you have seen my uh, culinary shows or maybe you have seen my music videos in youtube but um, today i have a special guest dr mobin Sied, md who joins me from California to talk about a topic that, it, you know, in one way or another, it touches our daily lives. So I want to say a few words about Dr. Mobin. He graduated from King Edward Medical University in 1994, and after practicing clinical medicine for a few years, he continued his studies in computer science with the goal of merging innovative technologies and healthcare. Dr. Mobin's dedication for teaching began at Horizon Medical Institute. His unique skills as a physician and software engineer enabled him to innovate several products, including a portable 3D ultrasound system designed by Meditech RI. His experience as a high-tech executive includes time spent at Staples, Kohl's, Rulala, uh, Gemvara, TJX, and most recently, e-commerce giant PayPal. Uh, Dr. Mobin's dedication to innovative and pioneering medical education has been a mainstay in his life. At Dr. Bean Corp, he strives to create a managed marketplace for medical providers that enables them to learn medicine in conjunction with new technologies. And Dr. Mobin loves painting, music, of course, I'm very happy about that, being a musician, medical illustrations, teaching, reading, and playing ping pong. Dr. Mobin, his wife, Hina, and his two sons currently live in the heart of Silicon Valley, Cupertino, California. So welcome, Dr. Mobin, to my YouTube channel. And um, how are you doing today? Thank you very much for having me. I am doing great. And thank you very much for a detailed and glowing introduction. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, my audience is usually an audience uh, who is passionate about health and nutrition. And today we will talk about a topic that doesn't specifically fall under that category. The topic is uh, COVID. And I really, I have to say, I started watching your videos a while back. I admire your professionalism and your knowledge. I like it how you don't really dive into anything political. You don't take sides of any kind. Uh, you're an open-minded uh, person. You, you present data and you present references and mostly it's not your opinions you just bring the facts and and discuss them and then you let us use our uh, analytical or our critical thinking to you know to decide what um, how to accept that and if you have any questions so um, let's get started then if that's okay with Absolutely. you Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. So um, my main question to start with, Dr. Mobin, uh, is to, if you could give us an overview of these 18 months or so after having time to study the behavior of COVID and to do more research, uh, where, you know, where were we 18 months ago and how has your views changed, if any, regarding COVID, including you know, to the present time. So thank you very much. Very good question. Um, of course, from a COVID point of view, we 
when we started December, January of last year and till then to here, I think there was hindsight 2020, there were some good and some bad that happened. Of course, the the I think, at least for my lifetime, the biggest human tragedy unfolded. At the same time, um, the decision making by our healthcare leaderships and their roles, it actually informed me, or my thinking is, they were not ready for pandemics. They were not ready for a misery that would befall 7 billion people all together and how to react to that. So what I saw was people became hungry and thirsty for knowledge to understand what are they facing. And this is a natural behavior as humans, that when we are challenged by something, when something makes us nervous, we start seeking more information to understand what to do. First, we avoid it. If we cannot avoid it, then we try to understand it. And the the huge gap on the side of our healthcare leaderships worldwide was that there was not much information given. Instead, there was a lot of biased, opinionate, opinionating things. There was a lot of politics. There was a lot of economic interests that emerged. These interests were uh, driven by for example, the pharmaceutical companies, these were driven by political interests. These are driven by people's egos, doctors' egos, researchers' egos, and so on. So uh, it's not just the pandemic that unfolded. It also unfolded a huge gap in people's understanding and people's uh, biases became clear. However, just from the virus point of view, where we stood was a virus that had 7 billion or more people available to it. and get into them and divide, replicate, and go to the next person. From there, the virus is much more, uh, much lesser uh, opportunistic at this time, although it still have billions of people at its disposal to continue to go to. But the uh, more vulnerable, advanced age, uh, people with multiple comorbidities, in some countries, not all, in some countries, these populations have become protected. Because of that, in some countries, the virus spread is slowing down. For example, in the US, I feel that in another, and I've been saying this for since March, February, March. So I am wrong in saying two months because those two months have gone. But still, I feel that we are um, reaching the end of pandemic for the US. I think that is a similar thing that you see with other countries, some of them, for example, UK, or Israel, and there are other countries too. I love how India has fared in this. At one point, they were looking like a disaster that was unfolding, and here we are, after their usage of certain drugs and, and behavioral changes, they have gotten ahead of it. So I think that we are looking towards the end of the pandemic. The coronavirus is not gonna go away. It is going to become more human, Plus, we are going to learn how to ma manage and live with it. In addition to this, just corollary that, as I said, healthcare's behavior, doctor's behavior, economic interests, these all things have unfolded to us with much more intensity as something that was just a suspicion. So I think there is a lot of uh, maturity that would occur as a result of this. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, so what is your view of this um, variant, the Delta variant, that there's so much confusion? You know, and unfortunately, we, we regular people hear one thing one day, another thing the next day, and it is more contagious. It is more lethal. It is not. It is. What have you, what are your views right now about this? about Delta variant? Absolutely. This is a great question, and you are very, very correct. And in my previous uh, part of the message, I should have uh, brought up media, for example. Media had played their own role. So if you think about it, what is media's need? They have landed on a great opportunity to have people come to their sites or their channels and listen and watch. And now the media is in a frenzy to say who can scare more, who can fear monger more, 
and that is how they they are uh, gravitate they're having people gravitate towards them so unfortunately we're in a vicious circle of more and more fear mongering competition is going on to catch more and more people so media created a bunch of hype as well some of that is also the naivety of the human population in general from how viruses work how immunology works how our, how our bodies work and so there is an educational aspect as well. Now, from the variants point of view, let me just, uh, I hope I have, uh, I won't take too much time, but it is important to understand the foundations of this. Any virus or bacteria or other pathogen that are in us, they would divide. Their, their job is to replicate or increase in number. When they're increasing in number, just like humans, when we have our babies, our babies are not an exact match of us. They are slightly different. Similarly, when virus has their babies or the daughters or the virions, new virions are produced, there are small genetic changes that appear in all of them. Those genetic changes sometimes are just silent. For example, um, A, the letter A is written by everyone in a different way, but it still reads A. So if there is a genetic code for, let's say, A, the viruses may have different patterns to write A. And these are silent changes, and we, we are fine with that. Then there are some times that the genetic material becomes so different that a part of virus or bacteria becomes enough different that either that new daughter that has those changes becomes disabled and cannot function correctly and dies or it becomes more aggressive can function even more com competently and becomes more fit and then takes over the next generations and they, these are what we uh, talk about as variants um, strains are usually reserved the the term strain is usually reserved for when a huge change in the shape or genetic material of the virus is done, which causes altogether different function or different clinical outcomes. For example, the examples of strain are SARS-CoV-1 versus SARS-CoV-2. They are two separate strains. They still are coronaviruses, but they have a very different clinical picture. Or MERS-CoV, Middle East Respiratory Syncytial Virus, uh, virus, I'm, res respiratory syndrome virus, that has a very different approach compared to SARS-CoV-2. So these are different strains. But within the SARS-CoV-2, if there are changes that are small enough that SARS-CoV-2 is still the same virus, it is still causing majority of the same issues, then we would call it a variant. Delta variant has about 16 or 17 changes in it. Those changes, some of them are on the spike protein. The changes on the spike protein, imagine my hand is a spike protein. The changes on the spike protein, and imagine this is the normal hand. It could be that the changes in the spike protein make my hand disabled and some fingers fall off. So that would be a negative change in the spike protein. That is an example of delta plus. Delta plus is called plus not because it is above the delta, but delta plus means on the delta variant, there is an additional change in the spike protein, which actually makes a spike protein less efficacious. It's a negative change. But going back to delta, there are changes in the spike protein that make it bind with the ACE2 enzyme more firmly and fast, rapidly. We say increased affinity is produced. That means when you put the original virus, let's say the one that emerged from Wuhan, when you put that and Delta side by side and put an ACE2 enzyme in front of them and ask them both to say, go catch it, the Delta one will more rapidly attack the enzyme and bind with it like a stronger magnet and just, you know, very quickly catch it. This is why Delta variant has taken over the other variants. 
Now, the interesting thing is this. When a virus or a pathogen learns to spread faster, usually it is accompanied by less lethal outcomes. There, there is a reason for that, and it's a very simple logical reason. The reason is, if let's say a virus has become rapid in, in uh, going to the other people, transmission, but whenever it goes to another person, it kills them. Let's say it has become more lethal. If it makes them very sick and kills them, then it would have less chance to spread because the person is now either on the bed at home or in a hospital or the person has died and the virus cannot propagate further. That means other viruses, other variants of the virus that are able to make persons less sick will have a chance to continue to get into people and spread more. And this one that is making people more sick will get behind, will be left behind, would lose the race. So usually when viruses spread faster, then their lethality starts reducing. So that is why they are spreading faster. Now, in case of Delta, it still has a silent window or the incubation time. So that means if I get Delta today, I might not know for a couple of days that I have Delta. In a couple of days, it would cause enough damage in my tissues that I may start having symptoms. Then I will know that I'm sick. And then depending upon the symptoms, either I'm home or in hospital. So this couple of days duration is more rapid or this is smaller than the Wuhan virus, who, which had a median symptom production time of five days. So again, if you put these two together, Wuhan virus would take five days to cause enough damage to cause symptoms, and Delta might just create symptoms within two days. Because of that silent window of two days, that is still sufficient for Delta to develop enough load and shed that it can still continue to spread. Now, the, co the concept of is it more dangerous? We know it spreads faster, six times faster. Is it more dangerous? If Delta was much more dangerous than original versions, then Delta would start getting disappeared because people would start dying that are receiving it. Instead, it is dangerous in a different way. And that is, it actually causes more tissue damage in shorter period of time. And that period of time is when it is still silent. And because of that, it still has lethality at least equal to the previous versions while it is fast as well. So that is how it is more dangerous, but it is not more lethal in general from the symptoms. For example, it has not learned to cause brain damage to us. That would be an additional thing. Or it did not learn to go and cause liver failure to us. That will be an additional thing. It is still doing the same things that previous one were doing. It is just doing it rapidly. And that is why it is important to get ahead of this with prophylaxis and whatever other things we can do and do early aggressive treatment. So this is the Delta variant. Now, would it continue to go on? Of course, this is at this time the prominent one. Still, vaccines are very efficacious with it. Other methods are very efficacious with it as well. They have not failed. And the newer versions of Delta 1, 2, 3 or Delta Plus, AY1, AY2, AY3, they are not stronger than Delta. So this is the state with Delta. All right. It, it makes so much sense. And I can tell that, you know, I love teaching. And I can tell that you are a, a very good teacher because you just presented this in such a clear way. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, since you just mentioned about early treatment, what, um, and this could be controversial. Some people are really, they don't want to hear um, anything else. Um, but I, I like to be open-minded and I like to make up my own mind. So I want to present this now to other people. Besides the vaccines, um, what other uh, methods 
do we have? And 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 I know that you have the the, the studies and the science behind it. Can you tell us a little bit about other methods? Absolutely, absolutely. So one, uh, this is not a plug to try to get your audience to my channel, but if you like food, I have done one video where I think the title of that is a food plate for a stronger immune system. And I did that in the context of COVID to say, what are the things that we need in our food and nutrition that is important to have a better immune system? So maybe if you can check that out, that is great. Generally, the way to approach this from a, from a lifestyle point of view and then medic medicine and then vaccines, from a lifestyle point of view, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, um, be less stressful or less stressed out. And the it is a very difficult thing to say when I, I almost say it daily and I get stresses as well. I get depressions as well. So it is not that I'm sitting here and preaching and hoping that we'll snap a finger and you would change from stresses. Stresses are part of life. And then on top of this with pandemic, we are locked down in homes, then our well-being, our contacts, our human contact, our, our financial well-being. There is so much damage that has occurred that I cannot just sit here and say it. But let me make a case for that. When we are stressed out, we release multiple hormones that would help us. In those, we try to keep our sugar levels high in our body during stresses so that muscles can use it. Our body's only way of defending a stress is to run we, because we always think some lion is chasing us or some other animal is chasing us. So our result to stress or re response to stress is always to increase blood sugar level so that muscles and brain can use that and to be alert and to run. That means we suppress a lot of other functions in our body in favor of muscles and brain to be more active. Now, you would agree that the stresses that we have nowadays, they don't mean that we need to run all the time. Uh, I could be sitting here and be stressed and I don't need to run. The stress is maybe because of some financial issue. So what happens is during the stress, the hormones, for example, more importantly, the epinephrine and norepinephrine, these hormones, when they are released, they cause natural killer cells to reduce in number and to reduce in function. This is the function of epinephrine. The result of that is natural killer cells are part of our innate immune system. That is their first responders to an infection. So when the natural killer cells are lesser in number, the SARS-CoV-2 finds it easier to damage our cells and kill us because our innate arm is not very strong. The other important thing is that studies have shown that those people whose natural killer cells are increased in number are better active than others. For example, children have it. These folks handle SARS-CoV-2 with less symptoms. Children handle it almost with no symptoms many times. And one of the reasons for that is more natural killer cells and more active natural killer cells. So when you are relaxed, your natural killer cells increase in number, plus they become more active. Now, how can you relax? There was a study from Japan in which what they did was they sent a group of people to city to say, go to a city and go and, uh, you know, drink and dance and relax. And they sent another uh, group of people to a forest to say, go and spend some time in forest and relax and enjoy there. Both groups came back after three days or some time. And what they saw was the people who were relaxing in a city, they didn't have increase in natural killer cell function or number, but those who went to a jungle or a forest, they had natural killer cells increase in number and uh, function. And they found out that phytoncytes, these are the essential oils released or oils released by the plants. These help improve the natural killer cell. 
So one is to be near the plants, go out for a walk in park, or, or if you can go to a forest or jungle or woods, go there, one. Secondly, light yoga also relaxes a person enough that their NK cell function improves. So that means adopt a more, deliberately adopt a more happy, less stressful lifestyle. That's one. Second part is better nutrition. In the better nutrition, what is important is more vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin A, and magnesium, calcium, and other such. Quercetin is very important. Now we know the foods for vitamins, so these should be improved in our diet. In addition to that, quercetin, for example, is found in foods that have red skin. So that means red apples, red onions, red bell peppers, and other red, red fruits have quercetin in them. With that, if zinc is added, that is a very powerful protective uh, mechanism. So that is a food side of it. And again, in my talk about a food plate, I talk a number of various kinds of plants and how they can offer these supplements and protections. Then we go to the medicine side. And there, the hydroxychloroquine and quercetin is a, a, and a zinc is very powerful combination. Hydroxy can cause cardiac arrhythmia, so one should be very careful and use it only with a doctor's advice. Nowadays, I like ivermectin more than hydroxy. It has, ivermectin has less side effects and is more, more potent. I have seen it to be more effective than hydroxy. So ivermectin's prophylaxis is very important. Uh, normal therapeutic dose for ivermectin, again, this is not an advice for anyone. This is more of an ed educational thing. This is more of studies that we have seen. So information and education is what is here not a medical advice. For medical advice, please talk with your doctor. Uh, ivermectin, 0 0.2 milligram, 0 0.15 milligram to 0 0.2 milligram per kilogram body weight is supposed to be a complete one dose. Um, the therapeutic usage of ivermectin for a deworming are usually once in a three months or six months or a year mostly given to young children, but ivermectin cannot be given to pregnant women and children that are smaller than two years of age or lesser than 15 kilogram of body weight. Above that, children can use it. Similarly, patients of meningitis or any other situation where blood-brain barrier may be injured, they cannot take ivermectin. For example, somebody who has stroke cannot take ivermectin. The Change in ivermectin's uh, therapeutic use at this time is that we had not, doctors had not used ivermectin on a daily basis or a weekly basis or bi weekly. So that is the change, and that is something that we do not know what are the outcomes of that. So far, that I've seen with my patients and with the doctors who report the usage, it's now about 16 months. Out of these, I think seven, eight, nine months have gone by where ivermectin became popular after Kelly's study in Australia. And I haven't seen any negative effects of ivermectin. What I've heard so far is sometimes people say, I get tunnel vision like vision if I take high dose ivermectin. And so I don't recommend high dose. And withdrawing the dose removes that side effect. The second side effect that I've uh, heard is the GIT disturbance. This is more common than the vision disturbance. And again, withdrawing or reducing the dose takes away that side effect. And the third one is important for older age. It is possible that there is dizziness which causes people to fall. So if an old person falls, they might break some bone or they might hit their head and this can be fatal. So this is important that somebody in advanced age who may be fragile otherwise as well, they should take it very, very carefully and with their doctor's support plus their family's support. So with ivermectin, there are other medicines. For example, statins are important. For example, anti-allergies are important. Anti-allergies like Allegra or Zyrtec or Zan or other, uh, there are some drugs which are 
banned in some countries. That's why I'm not naming them all. Um, but anti allergies are also useful because they keep the long haul COVID uh, suppressed or suppressed for, or they uh, they prevent it from occurring. And so after these is the vaccines as well. I used to say, and I still maintain this, these drugs, vitamin Ds, magnesium, calcium, K2, vitamin C, ivermectin, hydroxy, quercetin, they are a bridge to the vaccine. Now, if you are healthy and if you are eligible for the vaccine, meaning you don't have any severe allergies or you're not too fragile, then vaccines are an important thing to reach and these things should be used the medicine should be used as a platform or as a bridge towards that so i hope that covers some part of it all it does it does very much and and again thank you for the clarity and um one question that i have seen people ask is that do people who have had covid still need to get vaccinated or do they now have natural immunity and and if they have natural immunity does it last forever or does it last for us five months or what very good question mm -hmm. so uh, multiple questions in this one so let me first start with how long natural immunity lasts so considering that the virus does not change enough that it becomes a new virus that is SARS-CoV-2, does not become SARS-CoV-3. It stays within SARS-CoV-2's two's dress, and it is variants Delta, Alpha, they, they don't matter, they're fine. If that is the case, and the person stays healthy as well, for example, I got infected today, and then I'm not immunosuppressed two months later, or I didn't develop a cancer of bone marrow, or I, I'm not taking some chemotherapy that is suppressing my immune system. If I'm healthy, if the virus is similar in nature, then the uh, immunity lasts. Now, how long? There are two types of studies that I would mention. One are from the previous SARS-CoV, that is MERS-CoV or SARS-CoV-1. They are not 100% applicable to SARS-CoV-2, but they're very near. And the second is the studies that are done on SARS-CoV-2. From SARS-CoV-1, there were some studies done to see how long the antibodies stay once the SARS-CoV-1 infects us. And they saw, the researchers saw, that the antibodies stayed on for two years and then they waned after that. The T cell, the memory T cells, helper cell and cytotoxic T cell, they saw that they continued on living in our bone marrow or other areas where lymph nodes, for example, where they live, they lived on for 10 years. So that is the possible um, immunity lasting for a long time if we take SARS-CoV-1 as an example and extrapolate that to SARS-CoV-2. In terms of SARS-CoV-2, there are multiple studies. There are some studies that have shown that the antibodies continue to be produced and being available for eight, nine months. The reason that these time windows are smaller because the virus has been with us for a smaller period of time and they can only do these studies by, by studying people. So as more and more time is passing, they are studying people every month and adding to the months. But it seems that the from the studies that the SARS-CoV-2's natural immunity would last just like SARS-CoV-1 as well, and that is for years. So that is one. The second part of this discussion that you said that, how about vaccine after the natural infection? There was a study from UK where what they did was they picked the people who had one natural infection and recovered, and then they gave them the vaccines, and then they observed the antibody levels. And what they saw was, and I've talked about this study, all the studies that I'm talking about, somewhere in my videos, there are references and links to them. In that study, what they saw was that after recovery from a natural infection, when the first dose of a vaccine was given, 
the responsive antibodies, titers or amount, let's say, in, in flexible terms, that increased sufficiently high to be protective. And when they gave the second dose, administered the second dose, the titer did not move up too much from there. That means after a natural infection, number one, the person is generally protected. But if they did take the vaccine as well, then one dose did the same thing as both doses did, almost the same thing. Having said that, there is a um, more administrative problem to solve as well. And that is those places which have vaccine passports, today they do not offer a chance to come in and say, hey, I was infected and I have recovered and I do not need a vaccine anymore. They don't accept that. And neither do they accept one dose after the natural infection. Ideally, what should have happened is that somebody who has become infected and recovered, they should be able to say that, hey, look, here is the document that I was infected and I have recovered and I'm fine, number one. Number two, if they still don't believe it, then the person should be able to go get T-detect test that is at least in the U.S. available, which would show memory T-cells, which proves that the person can defend against the COVID and will not be shedding COVID any more than the vaccinated or others. But that is also not available. And final comment here is that the antibodies waning. This is a normal behavior of our immune system that when we encounter a pathogen, we start making antibodies against it. If it is the first time we encounter it, we can take up to two weeks to learn and synthesize the antibodies against it and then to release them. But if it is a, a repeated encounter, then we can make them very fast because we keep memory cells. Now, when the antibodies are made, our immune system usually takes care of the pathogen within 8-10 days. You can see that with SARS-CoV-2, in some people we can't do that and they die. So in majority of the people, immune system would clear out the pathogen within 8-10 days. Then it will still continue to make antibodies for months this is, uh, I was giving this example last night in my show. This is equal to, let's say somebody's house gets attacked. And what they do is they put guards outside. And now they would keep the guards there for some time, maybe three months, four months, a year, thinking that maybe the people who attacked would come back and we need to protect. But if they do not come back for three months, four months, six months, then the guards may be released and maybe one or two guards are left and then the remaining let's say 50 guards will be saying hey we don't need you that's the way our, our body works when we start making antibodies our immune system would continue to watch for the antigen that is SARS-CoV-2 for example in this context to come back in our body and if it does not visit us our immune system after three four months would say you know what enough of antibodies I'm going to re reduce producing antibodies. And it is a good thing that immune system does it. Otherwise, from a childhood till now, if we were still making antibodies against every single pathogen and making it to the same level as the active infection, then our blood will be thick like milkshake because of all of those extra proteins in it. But we don't do it. We wean down, we we kill the cells that are making antibodies, we'll keep some cells as a memory cell to make their copies in the future if the antigen comes in. So that means antibodies will naturally wane. And uh, I'm sorry, this is Luffy sitting next to me playing on this chair. Uh, so the antibodies would start waning after three, four months. That do does not mean that they are gone. That simply means the immune system has ramped down the activity and when the infection would occur, then it would immediately make copies of those memory cells and start making antibodies again. And one final comment on this one, 
a few days ago, I saw a study where they said, we have observed that the antibodies after a natural infection, they wane. And when we give one dose of a vaccine, the antibody levels increase by 42 times. And that was, hey, vaccines are very important. And vaccines are important, but that was a disingenuous way of assessing. Any time after the antibodies have waned, if a person would get infection or vaccine, it is an exposure to the antigen again, and our body is going to wake up the cells, make copies, and make more antibodies. So why it was disingenuous is that body would not have behaved that way just with the vaccine if the infection would have arrived our body would have made 42 times or 50 times or 100 times more antibodies as well. So the summary of this part of the discussion is natural infection is robust as well, is protective as well, and that can be seen with the studies. Vaccines are very important as well. After a natural infection, given, giving vaccines is not really very useful, but one dose does the same thing as two doses. So I hope that answers the question okay okay yeah very very clear thank you and luffy it's your cat right yes luffy is my cat he's sitting here and grooming himself and so his oh. phone is moving and i hope he's not his sound is not bothered. yeah I, well i think many of us have seen your cat in other videos so yes. very good well geez dr mobin since you mentioned a, a while back um something about being healthy um i have i there's something that is puzzling to me and disappointing at the same time. And that is, we are at a time when people, when governments and, and, and media have people's attention. And um, besides, of course, besides talking about vaccines, um, no mention is made whatsoever about the importance of being healthy and, and especially nutrition uh, to prevent and in many cases uh, revert things like obesity which brings many other things like diabetes and hypertension and things like that which are important it seems to be that, that this in this virus those comorbidities uh, take people to to the hospitals and many times they 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 die so what is your opinion or do you have an opinion why why is it that nothing is being said about changing the way that what we call the standard American diet that it's so uh, poor in, in in nutrition? Do you do you? So, do you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think that I will not go into the so there is a complete set of theories which are conspiracy theories that somehow yeah. this is an agenda to damage people and to depopulate. So I don't believe in that. My thinking is very simple. My thinking is that there is a there is an ego part and there is an incompetence part. They both are playing their effect. And how does that happen? I, I don't exactly know why they did it, but for example, if you take CDCs or NIH or FDAs, I had in my thought that we are USA and we were, we have been leading the world in so many things and we would show the world how well we can manage a pandemic as well. So I thought, I used to think, there will be stalls on every street and I say it very many times in my talks, that there will be stalls on big streets and people will be passing by and they would they can stop there and over there there will be people from CDCs, FDAs, and they would say, hey guys, do you know that you need to stay relaxed? Do you know that you can eat good foods? And here is a list of good foods that you can use. Hey, obesity is a is a risk factor, and you should do the following things to become more fit. And the uh, for example, People with my skin color or black or brown or not white, they, they have less vitamin D levels. So here is, we can, we can test your vitamin D right now, right here. There are tests that are available which can do vitamin D testing within a few minutes. Um, in Europe, they are available. In US, they actually banned them. They actually banned them 
to be sold here. So I thought that the, there would be stalls like that. With that, there would be a chart. They would say, what is your age? What is your sex? What is your comorbidities? And based on that, here are the things to not do. Here are the things to do. Walk this much every day. That would help you reduce this weight. Uh, get this much vitamin D. Go out for 25 day, minutes when the sun is at this specific angle. And if you are living in, let's say, on East Coast, you have less sun exposure. Do this. Take vitamin so I thought those things would have been there. And if I can think about CDCs, FDAs, NIH, what else did they have to do when we all, the whole country, the whole world was shut down trying to figure out a solution and there is nothing else in our mind than to figure out a solution? What were these hundreds and thousands of people doing? So I am disappointed. And I consider this to be their incompetence. And this is what I say that they were not ready to handle a pandemic. They were more of a red tape bureaucratic system that just behaved the same way as it behaves generally. And in that process, really dropped the ball. Now, there is also an ego part in this. And the ego part is the folks who are sitting in these organizations, again, I'm trying to read their mind. And I may be wrong, but their actions show what their mindset may be. And their mindset is, at least from their actions, we don't care for vitamin D. It, it doesn't have much to do with all of this. We don't care for ivermectins. We don't care for hydroxy. We don't care for quercetin. We don't care for zinc. We don't care for vitamin C, vitamin E, and so on. That is the ego part. Where... They are not even looking at the studies. And in some cases, there is a corruption part as well. And where they're looking at the study are misinterpreting them deliberately. And um, that is the unfortunate part. So if you look at what is happening from these leadership organizations, they had the best resources. They had, you know, we say that, that hey, you had one job. This was their job. It was not Dr. Mubin's job or other folks' job. It was really their job to sit down, think about these things, discuss this internally, come back with some solution, do a weekly briefing, uh, go on television, and don't do this Fauci um, science thing. Again, um, it's not about democratic or public positioning. I just think it is just very strange that folks like Fauci, and if Fauci is thinking that way, then the whole organization would think that way, that the only solution is a vaccine because we are not going to give anything else a thought either. And if we are going to give a thought, for example, WHO and Dr. Andrew Hill, then um, we are going to twist that enough to taint it. Think about WHO and this Sergi uh, Saphir, was it the name of that company, I'm forgetting the name, that company which came back and they said that hydroxy is um, shown to be incorrect. And they had all cooked up data. They had lied about where they got the data. They talked about Australian hospitals and said, we took the data from there. And hospitals said, we never gave them this data. And they came back and they created a study which they used. And WHO, based on that, said hydroxy stopped. Lancet published that. I believe New England of General of Medicine published it. Then they all recanted and retracted. I have not seen any negative outcome for that company that knowingly lied and then caused WHO to create a news cycle to say hydroxy is bad. That hydroxy is bad message went throughout the world. And when I used to talk with my friends who are internationally practicing, and I would say, do you use hydroxy? They would say, didn't you hear that WHO said, don't use hydroxy? So to your question, not only the, these leadership organizations did not do the right thing in terms of how to handle a pandemic, that was one drop, drop ball, they were in their ego as well, and they were corrupt as well. Now, all of them were that way, I don't know. But the action, the outcomes show how the whole organizations were actually 
not even zero they were negative for us they caused damage in majority of the cases in my opinion oh, right right all right well dr Malbin, we're getting close to the end of our webinar but and and this it wasn't my uh, my goal to have a a whole food plant-based discussion because i really wanted to hear more about your your views on COVID, but I have someone here in the chat who is a retired doctor and MD that just says, um, uh, let's see, why Dr. Bean has been reluctant to address the role of, of a whole plant-based nutrition and reversing up to 80% of all chronic diseases. A recent study shows this diet to be 73% effective in preventing severe COVID. And uh, and then someone else says that they would be they they would love to see more discussion in your channel about nutrition and vitamin D in his shows and interviews with other doctors like Dr. Gregor, Dr. Barnard, things like that. Is, uh, do you have a plan to maybe include a little more about this topic of nutrition, or is or will you folk continue the way you've been going in your shows? So uh, very good. So Nick Ariza has been a regular on Dr. Bean channel as well. I haven't seen him lately. Maybe wow. he's not very happy. But uh, to Nick's uh, point, mm -hmm. Nick, I had requested you sometimes to say, why don't you come on as a guest as well and enlighten the cool beans about what you think, number one. Number two, for me to just drop the stream of thought or the studies that I'm presenting and just go to a whole plant-based uh, diet. I'm just not an expert in that. So either I have to do the researches and start presenting my naive thoughts, but I don't think that my platform is ready to start saying, today I learned something about the plants this way. There are much, much better resources for better plant-based diets, many more doctors, as you have been referencing them as well, many more books as well. So does that mean that I do not like plant-based drugs or, or, sorry, therapies? No, I don't. I, I love them. I'm just not an expert on that. And I have said it many times. Because I'm not an expert, I find it difficult for me to uh, just talk wholly about that. And I will not until there is somebody who would join me and we discuss it who knows more than me. Um, you had actually asked for a couple of guests. We reach out to them and they, they didn't want to come on. So I find it difficult for me to just become an expert overnight and talk about it. So that is my dis, uh, response to Nick. Patrick says, is Dr. Mubin open to discuss more about nutrition and vitamin D in his shows? Patrick, I think that vitamin D discussion, the most number of videos about vitamin D are on my show and uh, please go check them out. I have been talking about vitamin D from the early part of last year and I have done multiple, multiple discussions about vitamin D. If they are not enough that we can, then we can do more. But once again, I'm not an expert in these areas. So for me to uh, rise up to the level of, a, of an expert in these, in these supplements, and say, I can tell you exactly what they are saying. I just cannot do that. But if you feel, for example, you have said, Patrick, uh, Michael Greger or Dr. Bernard or Michael Hulk, Hull is so great. If we have other doctors who have talked about it, that is great. I can see if I can invite them or learn from them. But I have done a lot of discussions about vitamin D and I've done a lot of discussions about nutrition. Right, right. All right, wonderful. Well, it, it, this has been a very pleasant uh, interview with you, and I hope that maybe in the future you will be willing to do another one because I really enjoyed enjoyed. Absolutely, it. whenever you like. Thank you very much. And um, I don't know if you'd like to tell uh, the viewers here anything about I don't know your website or if you have social media, how they can follow you, if you have. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. So my uh, YouTube channel is Dr. Bean Medical Lectures. Uh, on Twitter, I am Dr. Bean underscore medical. 
I have a website called drbean.com. So these are all various places where you can find us. Okay. And once again, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you to your audience for listening to my sure. message. Well, uh, when, this, when this webinar goes out as a replay, I will include all of your links for the social media and website. So thank you again, Dr. Bean, and uh, hope to see you. You're very welcome. Pleasure to be here. Okay. Bye-bye.